to the opening episode of The Fighter here on Air Sport. I'm Kevin Byrne and with me tonight is TJ Doheny, Ireland's only male world champion. Okay, TJ. So you've come from Port Leash originally via Australia, based in America. How have you ended up here with a world title belt in front of you? Uh, I'm almost a true definition of a world champion, you know. I've come from Port Leash, moved to Australia, fought in Thailand, Japan, based in America. And um, yeah, here I am now sitting with a world title. Yeah. It's been a long, hard road, but um, here we are. You uh, had your first fight, 27 kilos, I believe, That's about eight years old. What can you tell us about it? <laughs> She's a long time ago now. That was in Arlingford, Kilkenny. I remember losing it, um, and I remember I was that small at 27 kilos climbing in under the bottom rope. <laughs> That's about as much as I can recall. Yeah. And you, you lost a few of your first amateur fights together, didn't That's you? That's right, yeah. I lost my first seven amateur fights. Don't ask me how I stayed in it, but it just must have been something in me. Yeah. Just loved the game. And what know? was it about boxing that attracted you? You're a talented footballer as well, I believe. Yeah, no, I, that was it. That was the toss-up. I was into a lot of sports, and uh, I think um, the boxing. I was having a bit more success in the boxing, and as everybody knows, you, you got to put 100% of your time into that. So once I hit 15, 16, I had to remove all the other sports and just um, focus on my boxing because it was getting pretty serious. Mm. And what was Port Leash Boxing Club like as a back then as a place to nurture your skills. Well, what do you recall from it? Oh, Port Leach Boxing Club, like, you know, when they, when they had the instalment of the high performance unit in Dublin, like, we were training under Pat Ryan, and, uh, like, we already had our own kind of style, high performance down there, which is like, Pat's like one of the top trainers in the country. And uh, he, he just had his, he always had his really good. And um, you can see we have a conveyor belt of champions every year, like, right up to world level fighters coming out of there, so. I couldn't have asked for a better boxing club to um, learn my trade. So you were pretty good as a, as a young guy, as a teenager, and you, you start, uh, you're winning tournaments internationally, picking up medals, you pick up some gold scalps in the Elite Senior Championships, you've beaten Carl Frampton. Uh, your journey towards the Olympics in 2008, what happened? Um, yeah, so the dream was on, it was set. I was probably favoured going into it, and I just had to just had the unfortunate timing of running into the little hot prospect that was coming through, John John Evan. And um, yeah, he pipped me in the finals and went on to, what happened was the number one and the number two was gonna, gonna get a qualifier each. And John Joe went and qualified in the first uh, qualifier, so that was me eliminated automatically, you know? So I um, kind of pulled the pin for a while and took a break and mm -hmm. headed on to Australia. Because he caught everybody unawares at the time. I remember Kenneth Egan hadn't qualified for the Olympics even at that stage, and suddenly this kid comes yeah, along and takes young it. Gun. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> John Joe was able to frustrate a lot of people, uh, like yourself, Carl Frampton. There was a few people behind him in the pecking order at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, did it? Did it hurt your belief that you didn't get to qualify for the Olympics, or um, how did you? How did you take that disappointment? Not so much my belief. I think it was just more of you know when you have your goals set. Like in Ireland, I think. At the amateur fighters, we're, we're groomed to be um, to be Olympic medalists. You know, mm. we don't really look at the pro scene. I'd never had any interest in it, so the Olympic Games is where I, where, where I always wanted to be. You know, I didn't care if it had to take me till I was thirty to get there. I was mm. going to stay amateur till I got it. So it, it hurt losing that, and then you know, it's, it's the Olympic road starts four years again. Then you know, so I had to reassess, and I, was, I got I got a little depressed, and I just I kind of needed a break from boxing after it. You know. At the time, what were you looking to do with the rest of your life when you went down to Australia? Had you been working at home before you went, or what, what was the, pl the long-term plan? Well, as I say, like, the setup we had in Port Leash, so I was, um, I was training full-time under Pat Ryan anyways, and then when we, we were up in the high performance, I was up there then in between, you know? But, um, yeah, when I went down to Australia, then I said I'd take, um, I said I'd take a year out, and, you know, as everybody knows, when boxing's in you, it's in you, you know. So it only took me 12, 18 months to put the gloves back on out there mm. and um, get the ball rolling again, you know. You're a bit of fun first, though. You got to enjoy Sydney and Australia, as many an Irish dad has before you. Yeah, a, li a little too much now, I'll be honest, you know. So that's what happens when I got out there, you know, got a job in the building sites and wages were unbelievable, especially when we couldn't even find work here in Ireland. And, uh, yeah, we were enjoying ourselves. And it was meant to be a year, I was meant to stay there, but... 
the lifestyle over there and just we were enjoying ourselves too much so I saw a picture of you on a on top of a scaffold I think it was about 79 meters or 80 meters high, high oh, from yeah, the Sydney. Yeah. looked like ants up on top of it yeah, did, we, did your, we built one of the tallest scaffolds in Sydney yeah, everything, did everything your boxing physique up. help you in the scaffolding game or? <laughs> no but I think I think it helped that was like I used to kind of in my head say like oh this is my strength and conditioning done for the day you know because mm. when I did turn uh, pro um, you know, I was working and training at the start for about two, three years before I was able to nail down some back in, you know. Mm. And did you get this the Sydney Stone? Did you find yourself suddenly you're over there eating and drinking and you, is that what brought yeah. you back to boxing? Yeah, I'd say the, the Sydney Couple of Stone. What, no, what happened was um, I was missing boxing and I was having a few amateur fights here and there. You know, I'd show up and I'd have a fight and then I'd disappear and, you know, yeah. I was just on and off kind of. And then... Um, it was 2012, I remember watching the Senior Championships online and um, it was the year for the qualifiers for um, the 2012 Olympics. That kind of gave me a little buzz and then I was looking at the likes of um, uh, Jamie Connell, I think, um, Carl Frampton having success in the pros and I was kind of like, you know what, I was mixing up with these guys in the amateurs, maybe, maybe, maybe I can make something of this, you know, and I, I kind of knew, I always knew I had the skills. But um, it was just I just needed to get that fire ignited, and I think then in 2012 I, I kind of got the buzz, and I just bit the bullet and said, right, let's go. We'll turn pro and see where it takes me. Yeah, because at the time back here, like the pro profession scene was just starting to wake up again. Carl Frampton was starting to do big things in uh -huh. Belfast. Uh, completely different scene down in down in Australia. You're fighting on dinner shows and paying for opponents and things like that to come over, so you can have a good standard of competition. How did you find the first couple of fights in Australia? Yeah, it was it was a little bit weird to be honest because I didn't understand, I didn't know anything about how the pro game works. I just thought I turn pro and yeah, let's fight, you know. But then the thing came, so, oh yeah, so you want to fight? Okay, well you got to sell X amount of tickets, and like you say, it was dinner shows and stuff. So the tickets aren't cheap; they're two hundred fifty dollars for like a dinner package and drinks. Mm -hmm. And you got to sell a table of ten, but you've got to sell multiple tables of ten because you got to say pay for your opponent to fly him in. Then you got to cover your own purse if if you sold enough tickets. And uh, yeah, so it was hard the first couple of fights. First, first two three years was hard mm -hmm. working as a scaffolder and trying to be um, mix a professional boxing career as well. You know. And uh, but you were doing twelve rounders by about your fifth fight, and you started to pick up uh, ranking titles. And suddenly, this this decision to turn professional in Australia was looking like a good thing. I think you entered the world rankings about 2013, 2014, yeah. So you could start to see the payoff already. Was did it feel like that for yourself? Yeah. Well, it was exciting. It kind of after that, I was kind of just you know I was going through the motions, and I was a pro, and you know I knew it was going to take time to build. And then an opportunity came to fight for um, a regional title, which they don't really hold much re relevance, but to get you a world ranking. I seen the opponent they put up, so I was like, yeah, I'll take that, because I knew I could beat him. Um, I think I won a fight by knockout. And yeah, I was in uh, I was in the world ratings after five, six fights, which was crazy. But, um, you know, a lot of fighters will get delusional when they get a world ranking. They think, oh, I'm eligible for a world title, let's go. And like, that's great to have that confidence, but I always kept, stay grounded you know we got two world title offers and um, I knocked them back straight away because I knew I wasn't ready I had seven fights when I got this phone call you know um, I, I believed I was going to get there eventually so why just take an opportunity and you know make a few quid and then set myself back 12 months instead of just keep building and building and I always knew I was going to get there eventually you know. So the ambition back then even is Madison Square Garden and these kind of venues or is it just um, well, what well, is I tell, it I'll tell you, Madison Square Garden was just an unbelievable experience. But I was, I was never looking at that. I was always looking at like, you know, building, just getting my wins and working my way through the rankings. The way I, I would have to do it because I, I never had promotional backing, never had any sponsors and stuff up until maybe three years ago. And so everything like I was working as a scaffolder. Like I remember even one time, um, I had a sweatsuit on in 35 degree heat the day of a weigh-in, scaffolding trying to make weight, you know. That's the harsh reality of it when you're starting out, when you don't have a promoter and stuff, you know, you gotta do this stuff to, to pay the bills because yeah. we weren't making enough money to be able to take a week or two off work, you know, because cost of living is expensive in Australia. Yeah, and there's gotta be a certain belief there behind the scenes or in, in you as well that you're able to knock back world title shots. I remember one was uh, Scott Quigg, I That's think, right, before he yeah. fought Carl Frampton, had an opponent that pulled out sick or injured or yeah. something like that, and then the offer comes in, you, you could suddenly, announce yourself in Britain and Ireland, but you've got the eyes on the long game and you yeah. turn it down. So the confidence is there that you're gonna get there eventually. Yeah, exactly, yeah, and that's a, 
what happened, what, the way I was thinking was like, why I turned professional is because I didn't reach my full potential as a, as an amateur. So when, when I, my decision when I was turning pro was to like, I have to give this 100% and, you know, not have any regrets because it was eating away at me when I was, even when I was in Sydney enjoying myself, it was always eating away at me during the week thinking about stuff I should have did right and all in the amateurs, you know. So when I turned pro, I wanted to do everything correct. And I knew, I knew not to make the wrong decisions and I knew that it was going to come eventually. Like, how can you go fight for a world title after seven fights? Just because you're eligible to fight, that does not mean that you're ready, you know? Mm. And I think even, like I only fought last year, um, uh, was it 2018, in Japan, and it was only then that I really felt like I was ready. So I think if I had to come any earlier, it would have been bad timing and everything's just coming at the right time for me now. Yeah. So you get the call to fight uh, for the world title in Australia, or in, in Tokyo. Uh, somewhere that's notoriously difficult for Irish fighters to win in. We don't get that many opportunities there. A lot of British fighters have fought there and lost. Wayne McCullough is the only fighter from Ireland or the UK to win a world title there. So the, the odds are stacked against you, against the guy, uh, Uasa, who's fought in this location many times before. How, how did you feel accepting the fight? Did you take it straight away? Um, well, yeah, because I, I had been sitting in the box seat for an eliminator for a long time and initially I was meant to fight Evgeny Gradovich, which is a former um, featherweight world champion. And that fight fell through like about three weeks before it was meant to happen because his eyesight deteriorated. He's actually retired now. Um, so then that was it, it was over. The dream was gone. I was like, I was after being in Boston for six months, I think, training, mm. wait, waiting on a shot or waiting on a fight to come. And uh, then my management team just pulled, the, pulled it out of fire and got me a fight against a kid in Thailand. So I had to go to Thailand, which is, you don't get wins over there, mm. you know, but this is my only opportunity. So it's a guy I, sh I should be able to beat. So I went and took it and I completely dominated the guy and he only won on a split decision, you know. So yeah. then when I, when I earned my um, world title shot, um, yeah, I was just waiting for it to be announced and I, w I was ready to go and I was confident I had the skills to beat Iwasa as well. Even though, like, as you say, I was like, I was against the odds and this, that and the other. On paper, Iwasa had the right to be favourite. Um, a lot of people were surprised, but we weren't one bit surprised because we knew we had the skills to beat him. It's just that nobody really knows much about me because there's not much footage out there of me, mm. you know. So they were just going off what they were reading on box rec, which is the worst thing you can do to try and make a prediction on a fight. But um, it was good to cause the shock and the upset because it got even more exposure than when I beat him, you know. Yeah, I guess that's a blessing in disguise to fight on these cards in Australia where there's no footage and you're just relying on the results. Like, a big part of your story as well is the, uh, the sacrifices and the isolation you've had to go through. You have, you know, you have a young family in Australia where you're based, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a young son only is two years old. Uh, Theo's almost two and I got a 14 year old daughter who lives yeah. in Ireland. So that, that like, stalls me from being able to get back to Ireland to spend time with her yeah. as well, you know, because I've, I have to dedicate myself to, yeah. to boxing to try and make this work. But even from Australia, you've had to go and base yourself in Boston as well to mm -hmm. just try and up your performances and up your level in order to get to this stage where you're in Tokyo yeah. fighting Iwasa. What's What was the experience like leaving your family behind? Yeah, so what happened was we knew we were knocking on the door and I was watching myself back and I was like, look, I got work to do. I'm being honest, I'm not a delusional fighter, I know, and I'm, even as a world champion, I'm still not the finished article, I'm far from it. I know I've still got work to do and I think that's why I'm improving all the time and it's probably a reason I am a world champion today, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, leaving, leaving the family and not being able to get back to Ireland and spend time with my daughter Nicole is, is very, very hard. But I think my fiance Rebecca, she gets it. She knows what it takes, you know, and she backs me and she, sometimes she gives me the, the kick up the bum I need to mm. go and do these, you know. And um, yeah, but I think it's just, it's all falling into place and it's, um, the sacrifice is really paying off now, you know. Your manager, uh, Mike Altamore, put up a picture of you backstage in Tokyo, just lying on the floor, completely yeah. elated. Uh, how, how, did, how did you pull off that victory and how, how did you find yourself in that situation? Um, what happened was, is, well, I, I got the decision and you know, there was just so much commotion in the ring and I was, I was in tears and I didn't really get a chance to, to embrace it properly. And because I was going from one person to the next taking pictures and then when we were on the way up to the, to the doctor to do my checkup, I was just like, Mike, go on ahead, I need a moment. And I just, I just fell to my knees because I was just, it was like it was a tough fight, you know, I was absolutely exhausted and I just really needed to just enjoy the moment for a second. Yeah. And then a few days later I see Mike had posted it, so it was, 
it was good that he captured the moment, but uh, it looks like it was like he's standing there with a the camera over yeah, me. Yeah. But I thought he was gone ahead, you know. But um, it's a, when I look back on that now, it actually still gives me a lump in my throat and that that feeling, you know, to remind me of what that felt at that moment. Do you watch the fight back often? Because it was a, it was a difficult fight. I watched it on a stream at home. Uh, it was difficult to get the difficult to get the footage. Uh, updating people on the internet. I remember the amount of people looking to try and get access to it. It was a tie fight. We didn't know who won after the twelve mm -hmm. rounds. Thought you might have got the decision. Do you remember the feeling at the end? Did you think they're going to give this to the home fighter yeah, here? I, I, I thought it was a, a lot of close rounds. Um, and I, I really was unsure, I'm not going to lie. And I said to my coach, Hector Bermudez, I was like, what do you think, coach? And he was just like, you got this A4. Really knowledgeable boxer. Calm. I'd never seen anybody yeah. so cool and calm about anything. Like even when I won the belt, he was just like, you know, he's been there, done that, he's used to it. He's trained multiple world champions, but... Yeah, I couldn't, um, and I'd see the result was called in Japanese. Yeah. So we're like, yeah, and then they went yeah, Shin the Champion, saw, yeah. and I think Shin Champion is new champion, but we didn't know and understood, you yeah. know, or we didn't understand it. It was only then when my hand was raised, I was like, yes. And I remember there was a couple of um, journalists saying, or oh, even Dahani's team looked shock, but it wasn't shock. It was a realization that, that I'm a world champion, you yeah. know, and it fell to my knees, you know. And um, yeah, but it was just great to get get the decision and prove a lot of naysayers wrong as well, you know. Did you have many naysayers over the years? Uh, not really, because as I say, I've come in under the radar, so yeah. I've I've kind of been able to swerve all that, you know. They're starting to come now, um, but I just keep proving them wrong, yeah. and um, that's just more motivation for me, you know. I enjoy it. So like doors open once you get this title, uh, you come home to Ireland. You have, you remember, you're on the back of the Independent. The uh, your local newspaper had you front and back. You had a ceremony yeah. back in. Back in Leash, uh, you signed with a new team, you signed with MTK, mm -hmm. Eddie Hearn and Matchroom swoop in, you're fighting over in America. And it's, it's pretty quick before your next fight is announced for uh, Madison Square Garden. Yeah. It's been a bit of a whirlwind since you won the title, as it, it's opened the doors you hoped it would. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so we, we, we knew um, the date, but we couldn't announce it because we obviously have to you know, dot a few I's and cross a few T's to get the contract over the line and stuff. So we always had the date in mind, but we didn't get to announce it until the week before, but it was just phenomenal. Since I um, since I've signed with MTK Global, like they, they've just given me back. Cause even though I was up leading into a world a world title fight, previous to that a lot of things weren't going my way, and I wasn't happy in boxing. I wasn't really enjoying it. I was only um, when I when I signed up at MTK Global through Mike Altamora, who who works for MTK Global also. It's only then when they started making the moves for me and re like treating me like the way I felt like I should have been treated, that I really rekindled my love for boxing again. Mm. And uh, yeah, we nailed down the Eddie Hearn deal and all of a sudden I'm fighting in Madison Square Garden in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And I'm about to go unify two, two belts in LA now. Yeah, so you, like, you always kept a low profile with the media, did a couple of interviews here and there, but suddenly you're in New York for fight week and you got to face the US media, you got to talk, maybe come a bit out of your comfort zone, but uh -huh. in the ring, you looked really comfortable against Takahashi. You took him apart, a uh, few knockdowns in the third round until uh, the referee stopped it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the, the 11th round, I think, the stoppage was. Yeah, that's was, right. You got cut again like you uh, did in your world title fight, but you looked extremely confident and quite dominant as well. Were you happy with your performance? Yeah, well, that's what I said in my interview afterwards. It's not a TJ fight without a black eye or a cut. Right. <laughs> I think it's just maybe so poor orthodox. You were just prone to head clashes. And uh, that's another thing, of a lot of cuts, but not many of them are from um, punches, they're all from head clashes, you know. But I was happy with my performance. Um, I think maybe because the build up into the fight, you know, we didn't know whether it was going to be on or not. And I just, I just probably could have been a little bit more sharper in camp and stuff. Mm. Um, but I still did enough work, you know, to win the fight. But um, I was happy with my performance, especially my first time fighting on a big platform to a bigger audi audience. Mm. Um, I took it all in my stride. I thought I was going to be a lot more nervous and you know putting a lot of pressure on myself. But no, I took I took it well and I'm happy to get that performance. I got a lot of good feedback from it, so yeah. we'll move on now. A couple of things happened in the ring afterwards. I saw first of all you put on your cap and uh, Eddie Hearn comes over and kind of lifts it to look at the cut. I think he was checking to see if you'd be okay for the unification yeah. fight. And then uh, your opponent for your next fight walks over, Danny Roman, the WBA champion. So. It looks all system go, systems go for a unification belt for you next. Yeah, so we, we, we had a little agreement before the fight that maybe it is going to happen. There was talks about it all week. Eddie's been mentioning it. But I just had my mind on the job that night. But then it was good for Danny to go up into the ring and challenge me like for the unification. And it's what, it's what um, 
It's what professional boxing needs. You don't need four champions in each division, all just defending and doing mandatories and stuff. The best need to fight the best. So you know, Danny got up into the ring. He didn't give me no, um, no uh, smack talk. You know, he was just very, uh, very honourable and very humble. You know, what, just what if he did? me. If he did, I probably would have gave it back to him, like you know. But he treated me with respect, so I'm going to treat him with a height of respect as well. And I'm not that kind of fighter, you know. But sometimes. I'm a little hothead, you know, so mm. if somebody pisses me off, I'm, I, w I will give it back to them, yeah, you know, course, but yeah. he was good, so we just did a little fist bump, we got a couple of photographs and the fight's on, and it's a, I don't think it's a fight that needs to generate hype, it's two world champions going up against each other, you know, so you don't need all that bullshit, um, trash talking and false stuff, I'm just not into it. Yeah, so if you, if you take Roman's scalp, I know you don't want to look past your next fight, but if you take... His scalp, you're looking to go WBC uh, and WBO as well. Yeah, and, see, that's the thing. Like when I won the world title, you know, I've thought I thought that was going to be my be all and end all. You know, I'd be, I'd be satisfied once I win the belt. You know, but it was great for a couple of weeks, and then when you get back from all the homecomings and the celebrations, and it's just like a massive come down. You know, because you're on such a high. Um, and then I was just sitting around. I was just thinking, like, what's what's next? You know, so. What what ideal scenario for me was to get in a handy defence, which I think I earned. Not I don't mean handy defence, but a voluntary defence. Yeah. Uh, a fight that I think I've earned because of the road I've taken to win the belt, and then possibly um, a unification with one of the other champions. And then we got the call that there was an offer there, you know, for Roman and stuff. Yeah. So I was absolutely delighted. So we get through Roman, and I think it's only fair that the fans get to see the other the other champions box off as well. But if they don't box off, I'm willing to fight another champion. Mm -hmm. I, that's where I want to be. You know, I want to be involved in those big fights. I have the buzz for that, and I'm, I think it's where I belong. You don't want to be taking backward steps and just no. doing um, voluntary defences. You know, nobody wants to see that. What about uh, domestic clashes? Like Ireland has a great history in the super bantamweight division with Wayne McCullough fought there and Willie Casey was European champion. Bernard Dunn and Carl Frampton had mm -hmm. world titles. Even Carl held it, the IBF as yeah, well. That's right, yeah. He's talking about going back down to super bantamweight. Ryan Burnett's been a unified champion at, at bantamweight. That's right. There's a couple of exciting fights to be made in Ireland. Are those ones that take your fancy? Well, the, um, there's been talks of them. I, I see on social media, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of fans are wanting to see these kind of fights. And that would be another another dream of mine has been to, um, the first All Ireland World Title fight, you know. So I would welcome those fights as well, and they're all high profile fights, so they're fights that I want to be in. But um, I'm not going to like go calling out those names because it's not my style. But if those fights can be made, I would welcome them in a happy, you know. It wouldn't take me long to accept those fights. So hopefully down the line, once I get my um, please God, a unify and get my my um, mandatory out of the way. Then those fights can be made, you know. Mm. I don't think it's fame, but w what is it you're fighting for? Like, is it money, sporting success? Yeah, it's, what is it's, it? It's most definitely not fame because yeah. I'm swerving interviews all the time. You know, it's not. I, I I don't really crave all the attention. Even like I'm I'm very um, held back on my social media and stuff. I really only use that for like announcing. I don't really engage on it. Mm. Um, my drive. And why I turned pro was to prove something to myself, nobody else. I knew I had the goods and I knew what, you know, I was calling myself a waste of talent, a waste of space. You, you should have did this, you could be here right now. So I gave the pro game a go and I wanted to prove to myself that I could become a world champion. And I've done everything in my power. I've done a lot of things to, to get myself into this position. I've sacrificed so much. My family, my children, they've all sacrificed so much. I'm just blessed to have um, my fiance that just absolutely gets boxing and she really, she knows what it takes. So um, yeah, here we are now, you know. Yeah. And future wise, are you, uh, do you have an Australian passport now? Are you going to be kicking up there for the long term? Or do you I'm, think you'll I'm eligible, I'm eligible for um, citizenship for a long time now, you know, but uh, I'm an Irish man through and through. I, I, I can't, I, I'll, I'll hold on to my Irish passport, you know. Maybe I can get dual citizenship, mm. but you cut my veins open, there's going to be green blood coming mm. on me, you know. I'm as Irish, I'm as Irish as the next man, you know. They've taken to you well, though, your success over there. I see, like, yeah. Dennis Hogan's success in Australia as well. Is, it's great, the Australian boxing fans are grateful for the success, and they take to you as well, don't they? Yeah, and see, um, the thing is, we've got a massive Irish community mm. over there, so that kind of generates the buzz. And then the Australian fans start getting on it because they see... When we, when we, the crowds we bring and you know there's another fighter there um, a good friend of mine Dara Foley mm. you know so um, he's he's, re he's really well known over there in Australia as well so yeah I'm getting a good reaction from them and um, I'm actually in the running for um, 
for the votes for going into the Australian Boxing Hall of Fame, which is happening in March. Okay. Which um, I'm pretty confident it's going to be me because I'm the only world champion in the list. So right. how can you not give it to me? You know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to sound. I don't want to sound like a bit of a. So you're saying that's in July. Um, which is that? The the Hall of Fame vote. Oh, the Hall of Fame vote's in March. Oh, March. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So you you might have gotten a chance to become unified champion by then. Yeah. But you never know. By yeah. the end of the year. By the end of the year. That's the ambition. God. By the end of the year, uh, please God, it'd be nice to become fighter of the year, you know. Fully confident to beating Roman when it happens? Um, yeah, I think um, when it popped up, I was like, yeah, out, out of all the champions, stylistically, I, 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 I rate myself as the best 122 in the world at the minute without sounding like a, a you know what. But um, I, I think Roman, stylistically, I think I'm really going to shine against him. Mm. He just has that style, what's really going to suit me, and it's going to allow me to box the way I really want to box. You know, I'm not going to be forced into chasing a lot around the ring, and I'm really going to shine in that fight. Excellent. Well, look, it's been great chatting to you tonight, TJ. Thanks very much for joining us on the first episode of The Fighter. Mm -hmm. oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And best wishes for the rest of the year. Yeah, thank you very much. So that's all we have time for tonight on The Fighter. Join us again next time.